Welcome to Health Hackers episode 48. My special guest today is Dr. Robert Siwas, aka the Carb Addiction Doc. If you've seen him on his YouTube channel, you'll be familiar with his straight talking, no fuss videos, podcasts, and vignettes of information aimed at those looking to find out what's at the root of their diabetes or obesity. Dr. Cyrus has an extensive background in weight management, including 18 years of performing obesity surgery over 8,000 times. He's also a board certified pediatric general surgeon and specializes in helping adults and teenagers through his practice in Palm Beach, Florida. Separate from his professional expertise, Dr. Cyrus is able to draw on his own personal weight management story. He used to weigh nearly 300 pounds and has described his experience as an ongoing journey of losing weight and understanding why he became heavy. Do not expect this video to be a lecture on eating less and exercising more. Dr. Cyrus is known for taking a different approach, one that looks at tackling addiction to carbohydrates. As always, Health Hackers viewers and listeners, anything you hear or see within Health Hackers content should not be considered personal or medical advice. Always talk to your own healthcare providers. Now let's begin. Dr. Cyrus, hello. Hi, Gemma. Thank you very much for having me on. It's great to be here. So let's start uh, by asking you, would you explain why it's problematic to be obese? Uh, Actually, that's a complete fallacy. Um, Really, the only thing that obesity does in a negative way is it hurts your hips, knees, ankles, and your weight-bearing joints. And most fat people don't look so good in a thong, whether you're male or female. Other than, in other words, there's a psychological component to it. Other than that, Obesity is actually the way the human body protects itself from the scourges and the ravages of sugar. It is when you stop being able to turn sugar into fat that bad things begin to happen. So it's a bizarre thing that everybody thinks of obesity as this awful thing. In fact, if you're able to make weight very easily, you walk past a donut and you gain five pounds, your body is actually doing its darn best to protect you from the scourge of what you're putting in your mouth. It's when that protective mechanism breaks down and the cells of the body begin to try to protect themselves from sugar and you stop being able to make fat that all the damage happens. There's a weight bearing joint, a gravitational joint problem with obesity and a cosmetic look problem for some people. I've been there, I've been those 300 pounds as you said, but other than that, obesity is protective, not harmful. Bizarre, isn't it? But that's the reality. So you mentioned the damage there, when there's damage being done. And, um, and you lecture and train and educate people on how carbohydrate addiction is a way of, of causing that damage. Am I right? Correct. So you know, there's two aspects. The first one is the biological or pathophysiologic injury that chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption does to the body. Um, The human body needs sugar in the bloodstream, but it does not need the consumption of sugar because the liver is very adept, very effective at producing sugar on your behalf. So the interesting thing is the human body is biologically set up to be demand driven for sugar. In other words, when the cells of the body require sugar, they place a demand on the liver and the healthy liver produces sugar. You never have to put it in your face. But what's happened in the modern era is we have started consuming sugar more and more and more, and we've become supply driven. And we have this oversupply of sugar to our bloodstream. And now the human body, the cells of the body are struggling to cope. And the sugar in the bloodstream damages the cells and the lining of the bloodstream and damage within the bloodstream we call diabetes. So elevated levels of sugar in the bloodstream mediate their damage in a form called diabetes. However, when excess sugar enters cells, it damages the inside of the cell in a highly concentrated manner. And those cells then suffer the consequences of that sugar and the cells try to protect themselves by resisting insulin. That's called insulin resistance. So at first, the cells can take up that sugar and turn it into fat. But when they stop being able to do that, That's when the sugar builds up inside the cells and damage starts to happen. And the way the cells protect themselves is to become resistant to insulin, which is the molecule that opens the door, unlocks the door to the cells so that the sugar can walk inside. 
So really, chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption causes damage in the blood vessels, causes insulin resistance, and those are the two things that cause disease in the human body. As long as your cells are able to turn that sugar into fat, it layers on you, but it's protective. Now, the question, the second part of the question is, why is it that we, are, that we eat sugar in abundance? And why is it that some people become fat and some people don't? Well, pretty much everybody in the Western world is, in fact, in the world, has access to alcohol. But not everybody's an alcoholic. I drink alcohol from time to time. I've been drunk from time to time. I use it as a wonderful, immediately effective substance just to dissipate emotional tension. So after a long, rough day, a glass of whiskey, a glass of South African wine, got to put a plug in for my South African friends, um, very effective at dissipating emotional tension. But if you start drinking more and more and more to numb, soothe, and obliterate your emotions, over time, you are no longer just dissipating, you are obliterating those emotions and that chronic excessive harm causes alcoholism with a consequence of liver disease and um, DUIs. In exactly the same way, sugar is a highly endorphin activating molecule. So as soon as it enters your system, it goes into your brain and triggers a wonderful endorphin response that is as relaxing as nicotine, alcohol, as some of the other substances we use. So if you have a healthy relationship with a diversity of different things that we do for emotional management, and sugar is one of those, and alcohol might be another, and exercise may be another, then you're using sugar, you might abuse it from time to time, but you're not addicted to it. However, if you have a deficiency of effective emotion management strategies, you've either never developed them, you're unable to use them, you build up all this emotional tension, and then you have that ice cream, you have those mashed potatoes, you have that carbohydrate, and it is such an instant powerful force in your brain that you then at a subconscious, just like with alcohol, at a subconscious level bond with that substance, and you bring it into your environment, you access it on a regular basis, and our society condones that. And you develop this relationship where you're eating and drinking and snacking on sugar and starch throughout the day to manage this, not your nutrition. And that chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption causes harm. And the harm is obesity, the harm is diabetes. If you now go ahead and just treat the obesity by losing weight by some calorie reductive diet, you're not addressing the addictive relationship. Of course, it's going to come back. Life throws you an emotional curveball. The only real response you can mount is to go back to the ice cream. And that's why diets fail. You compared the sugar to alcohol or carbs to alcohol. Do you believe that an addiction to carbohydrates is as intense as an addiction to alcohol or nicotine? It's more intense than alcohol and nicotine. It is easier to quit drinking alcohol and nicotine than it is to quit carbohydrates. And there, there's several reasons. Number one, the biologic drive to consume sugar is much more intense than the biologic drive to consume nicotine or alcohol. So because there is historically in our evolution a benefit to consuming sugar. In the old days, historically, when... Um, a deficit or a deficiency of adequate nutrition was the prevailing human experience. Only in the last hundred years or so have we be, be, been inundated with abundance and the human biology, the human genetics cannot tolerate, has not learned to cope with abundant nutrition access. That's the first thing. The second thing is sugar is highly, highly, highly concentrated. We have taken something rudimentary and hybridized it and grown it. For example, heroin. Sugar is about as addictive as heroin. Heroin comes from a cocoa leaf. And you concentrate it and you concentrate it. Now you've got this powder that you can liquidize and inject. Well, in the old days, carbohydrates were these little grasses and little seeds and tiny rudimentary sour little fruits. And we've hybridized them and hybridized them and hybridized them. Now we've got apples this size that are full of sugar. Corn is this huge big thing. It used to be a little grass. We've concentrated the sugar. So it's highly, highly concentrated and as addictive as heroin. And then the other big issue is that society condones 
carbohydrate consumption. In America, and both of you, both you and I are from other places, but in this country, it is, you have to go out of your way not to be fat because carbohydrates are ubiquitously available. From Starbucks to the shops, to your friends' houses, to parties, to treats, they're everywhere. And you have to go out of your way to avoid excessive carbohydrate consumption. So I would tell you that it's more addictive biologically and from a societal perspective. Society condones the consumption of carbohydrates. It has disdain at a certain level for the consumption of nicotine and, and, and um, alcohol, except now that vaping has become this wonderful new thing promoted by tobacco companies. And that is becoming almost as dangerous for our youth as, as carbohydrates. But no, uh, uh, carbohydrates are more available and more addictive than either of those two things you mentioned. And they are on a level of um, heroin. And yet for every one person, or, or let's, let's, let me give you a different statistic. More people die in one day of carbohydrate toxicity than die in a year of heroin overdose. Think about that. More people die of heart attacks and strokes and con the direct consequences of chronic excessive sugar consumption in one day in America than die of heroin addiction in a year. And yet if you look at the resources and the focus on heroin addiction, it is enormous. And as a doctor, we suffer, as a surgeon, we suffer those consequences, but nobody is touching carbohydrate consumption. In fact, the US diet guidelines that are coming out this year don't even mention carbohydrates as being problematic. Yeah, we often hear debates over low calorie versus low carb diets. And as an obesity expert, um, what's your view on calorie counting? Do you agree that some people do get on well with it? Absolutely not. Now, calorie counting is a system. It's a mathematical formula that we've created as human beings to quantify something that the human, body, the human body has no control over. I'll give you a little example. When it comes to water, nobody should or really does decide how much water they're drinking. When you're thirsty, it's a miserable feeling. Your body needs water. You start to drink, and at some point, half a glass, two glasses, three glasses, a, a message goes from your belly to your brain that says, Gemma, you're done, and you automatically stop drinking water, and you're done. When it comes to alcohol, there is no negative of feedback. There is no stopping point. So we have created a mathematical formula called ounces of drinks and numbers, uh, numbers of, of drinks. I know my limits are two or three drinks of, of uh, spirits, two or three glasses of wine, three or four beers. That's my limit, but I can readily supersede it. But we human beings have created a mathematical formula to quantify how much it's safe to drink in terms of alcohol. We don't need that for water. When it comes to food, the steak, vegetables, that kind of thing. The human body has very tight built-in control. You never have to quantify that by the calorie. Because let's say you're really hungry and I put a big salad or a big steak in front of you, I don't mind which. You start eating, you're hungry, but at some point in that eating journey, oh my goodness, I'm stuffed, I'm full. And you don't, you're down tools and that's it. No more steak, no more salad. But two minutes later, you're not picking it, nibbling at more steak, but you are eating some ice cream. You are eating some uh, chips sitting in front of the TV with some pretzels or some chips. There is no stopping point for the consumption of carbohydrates. There is very tight stopping points for the consumption of food. It is impossible to become fat from eating food, which by definition is what we need for, for human survival. However, what we human beings have done is we since we introduced carbohydrates into our food system and there is no stopping point for the consumption, just like with ounces of alcohol, we created a mathematical formula to quantify how much is reasonable to eat. And the math mathematical formula is called calories. It is an artificial system, an arbitrary artificial system that is exclusive to carbohydrates and we base portion control on this. I bet you I'm bigger than you, I'm six foot tall, um, and I'm certainly heavier than you, but if you and I go to a restaurant and we order the same food, they'll put the same amount of food in front of us and we'll probably both finish the same amount of food. There is no recognition of what that stopping point is anymore. So therefore, we use calories as an arbitrary system to quantify how much we should eat. I'm a little older than you, 
in the 1960s when I was growing up, a hamburger was about the size of a slider. And if we had a Coke with it, it would be a little 270 mixer of Coke. And we were stuffed. Now you go to Wendy's or McDonald's and it's the, the triple burger with the fries and the 64 ounce Dr. Pepper and we can finish it. Human beings have lost the capacity of quantity control because of carbohydrates. Therefore, we use calories. And yes, if you reduce your caloric count for a little while, that's called starvation. And you can lose weight temporarily in a starvation model. It doesn't matter what the diet is. Whether it's an elimination diet, you eliminate fat, you eliminate meat, you eliminate carbohydrates, or it's a Weight Watchers or a Nutrisystem, which is a caloric quantity control system. You lose weight but it is unsustainable. I've heard you say that you actually hate the word diet, and I'm guessing now this is why, yeah? Yeah, well, you know, diets are fine for skinny people who become a little sloppy and lazy and have gained five pounds. You put yourself on a little bit of calorie restriction, you lose the five pounds. If I go out one night and I get hammered with alcohol, I wake because I've abused alcohol, I wake up the next morning, I say, man, that was terrible, and I don't drink for a month. I'm in charge of that, even though I've abused it. So otherwise healthy people who gain a few pounds, they have that control. When you top out at 300 pounds like I did, when you've got type 2 diabetes, you have comprehensively lost control of that relationship. You're the equivalent of an alcoholic. And going on a diet may get you to lose weight transiently, even for a year or two. And that's what surgery does as well. Surgery is just the most powerful caloric restriction out there. It's just a diet. But pretty much everybody fails, 98 plus percent of people who have a serious problem, obesity or diabetes or metabolic syndrome, fail that diet because they, do, they address the consequence of the problem, not the root cause. The root cause is addiction. The root cause is dysfunctional emotional management. It isn't calories. It isn't the weight. The excess weight is just the consequence of the drug that you happen to be addicted to. If that was smoke nicotine, we'd be talking about heart attack, at least we'd be talking about uh, uh, emphysema and lung cancer. If it was heroin, we'd be talking about turning blue and dying. But the alcoholic doesn't try to drink less to avoid a DUI. They understand they've got to quit drinking. That's why I don't like the word diets for my patient population. What do you do with your patients then? Do you just encourage them to quit carbs, but treating them as though it's an addiction? So, you know, if a guy comes into my office and he's had five DUIs and he says, Doc, I don't want to go back to jail. I don't want another DUI. If I focus on the DUI, we're completely missing the point that he's actually an alcoholic. So when people come in and they're obese, they have type 2 diabetes, they have metabolic syndrome, hypertension, polycystic ovarian syndrome, they're trying to get pregnant. I have to ignore the problem or what they come in is the problem, which is really the consequence. And I first and foremost have to help them to understand that they are carbohydrate addicts. And once that penny drops, once they recognize that my relationship with carbohydrates is out of control and never will be in control, we have to help them to work to a point of abstinence. But the problem is when you remove carbohydrates from your world, you leave two major deficits. You leave a nutritional deficit and you leave an emotion management deficit. So the second part, once they have ownership of the fact that actually my problem isn't my obesity, my problem is my use of sugar and starch for my emotional management. Once they recognize that and have ownership of that, then we can slowly begin to remove carbohydrates from their way of life. You don't do it in an instant like you do on a diet. You're going to choke on the elephant. You eat an elephant in little pieces. So we slowly remove the carbohydrates at the same time, we help to have them help them to develop a proper human diet, a nutritionally formatted diet, which is basically anything devoid of carbohydrates. And equally importantly, in fact, more importantly, we help them to slowly develop an effort based emotion management system. And the difference with a substance abuse system and an effort based system is that in Addictive behavior or addictive substances, the reward is up front. You get high immediately, and there's a consequence to be paid on the back end. In an effort based system, you have to put intense effort in up front, and the reward is on the back end. I'll give you an example. If after this discussion, it's been very stressful for me, I'm all stressed and tired, and I drink a bottle of Jack Daniels to calm me down, and I pass out. Instant reward 
with negativity, guilt, harm, and, on the, uh, and repression of the issues that were causing my emotional tension on the back end. Not a very effective system. If, on the other hand, after this discussion, I get outside, it's a beautiful evening here in Jacksonville, and I go for a long walk. The walk requires effort. But while I'm walking, that physical activity is an endorphin relaxer. It relaxes me. I can now, on that walk, process the issues that cause my emotional tension. And when I come back from the walk, I can feel proud of myself for going for that walk. And in little increments, that pride builds up my self-esteem and my self-confidence. That's the difference between an effort-based emotion management system and a substance abuse or an addictive behavior emotion management system. Would you say that you are currently in recovery from a carbohydrate addiction? I, I don't like the word recovery. I'll use the word remission. Same, same kind of thing. But yeah, it's an ongoing process. I will always, I will always have muscle memory for carbohydrates. But as long as I practice every day, physical activity, spirituality, meditation, participate in the creative arts, have empathetic human connection that are the four cornerstones of an effort-based emotion management system. If I practice those and have current muscle memory for those, then when life throws me a curveball or I have emotional tension I have to, have to release, I'm far more likely to go to what I do every day than to go back to something I haven't done in a long time. So by removing carbohydrates from my environment, my muscle memory has faded. It never goes to zero. Because if I go out and I have a tub of ice cream tonight, it's going to be six months and 30 pounds before I get back on track. And that's what people don't understand, is that when you trip and fall once, if an alcoholic goes out and has been sober for 10 years and has a bender and gets hammered, that's fine if you can wake up the next morning and be sober again. The problem is they can't. That's why alcoholics have to quit drinking. That's why I cannot eat carbohydrates. Because once I give myself permission, and addiction is managed through the word permission, once I distort my own reality enough, ignore my 300 pounds enough to give myself permission to have some M&Ms and, and ice cream, that first bite, that first taste is the relapse. How easy is it for you to spot carbohydrate addiction in someone else? What are the key signs Good question. The, the easiest one for yourself and for uh, um, my patients, look in the mirror. If you're fat, it's obvious. Uh, and, and that is the commonest effect of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption is overweight or obesity. And by the way, you know the commonest demographic right now for obesity in this country? Two to five-year-olds. Two to five-year-olds. Okay, think about how sad that is. So as a pediatric surgeon, I see chubby babies all the time. And once they get to a year or two old and they're off the breast, you can spot carbohydrate addiction even in two to five-year-olds. So obesity is the first one. But the, it's a very good question because <clears throat> there are people walking out there that may be a little bit overweight, but they don't know that they've got a carbohydrate addiction until their toes fall off, until they have that heart attack or that stroke. You've got athletes out there running marathons who are carb loading, who are as addicted to carbohydrates as a 300 pound person. But they don't know it, I call it the dead runners club. These are the guys that are out there running a race and they dropped dead of a heart attack. Oh, but Bill or Jimmy was so healthy, he was so fit. Yes, he might've looked lean because on those runs he burnt off the calories. But carbohydrates are toxic at ingestion. Nobody smokes three cigarettes and goes for a run to breathe out the nicotine. But we tell people all the time, oh, go run off the exit, go and exercise off the calories. It doesn't work that way. The damage is done as soon as it enters your body. And no matter how fit you are, if you're a carb loader, addictive or doing it as some bizarre, somebody told you it was a performance enhancer or you have to use carbohydrates when you're an athlete, which is for the most part garbage, those people are doing damage to their bodies, but it's not visible. It only becomes visible when it has an irre irre irreconcilable problem. Your toes drop off, you, you have a heart attack, you have a stroke. Those are the ways we see carbohydrate addiction as much as we see it in obesity. You mentioned two to five-year-olds there. I wonder, what would you 
give your own child as a treat instead of sweets and cakes? And actually, should we stop calling sugary foods treats? Right. That's, that's a really good question. And it's a pertinent question because I'm a, my wife is about to drop a baby on the 22nd of August. So um, she's actually, one of the things about it is that the, the um, imprinting is what the mom does to her child from an emotion management perspective in utero. If mom's stressed out and she has a cigarette, that baby's very likely to be a smoker. If mom is stressed out and she's a runner, that baby is far more likely to be physically active. If mom is stressed out and she eats ice cream, that baby already is imprinted with carbohydrates. And when they're exposed to it afterwards, that's what they become. <clears throat> so um, what, I, what I think, first of all, a treat. Um, would you buy your child a pack of Marlboro and uh, some Bud Light and say, here's a treat for you? No, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. That's idiotic. But to my mind, it is as idiotic to call it a treat. But remember earlier on when I said carbohydrate addiction is worse than nicotine and alcohol, there is almost no mother out there that would intentionally deprive their child of the drug that is most likely to kill them in the future. And in fact, I'll tell you, I just had a conversation. It's, quite, it's a sad but a real conversation with a, a lady last night a mom of a young child, young, young child, under five years of age, under six years of age, who is a type one diabetic. And we manage our type one diabetics by removing sugar carbohydrates from their life. The standard way is to give them carbohydrates and treat it with insulin. Well, this baby, this child has a CGM, so she's, she has to wear a monitor, which is a needle that goes into the skin. And the mom has to give the child injections of insulin four, five, six times a day. Can you imagine that as a mom? And whenever that child goes for parties with its other, with its friends, with uh, to to get togethers with its friends, the first thing the parents do, the other parents, is they give the children treats, and it's always sugary. And then the mom has to come behind that child with a needle and jab needles into that poor child to manage or to try to manage the sugar that that child is being given. And the, the parents, the other family members or the, other, uh, the parents of the other children cannot fathom that those carbohydrates are toxic for that child. So the advice I gave that mom is don't ask those, those parents to say, don't give my child carbohydrates, please. Just lift up that child's shirt and show them the bruises and the needle marks where you're sticking a needle in four to six times a day. That's real. That's real. Now, that's a type 1 diabetic. But the parents that are feeding their kids treats are creating that same diabetes for their kids. So culturally, we need to make that cultural shift. But it's, I'm going to be dead of old age for a long time before that actually happens. It is so, so sad in my clinical practice as a pediatric surgeon to see these chubby kids coming in as normal. Now, when I see a normal child coming in, the mom always tells me that she's being persecuted because she's being told she doesn't feed the child. And I know that my wife is gonna have the same problem with our child, who's going to be a normal weight child in the face of everybody else who's not normal. And it's a sad, sad day in this country that that is happening. Well, on that point, when you come across people and fellow doctors and those in the medical community and scientific community, and they say to you, stop demonizing carbohydrates. There's, there's no such thing as a carb addiction. How do you respond to those voices? Right. And, and you know, that is the common perception. Again, it's fostered. And, and this is a problem we have in this country and also and elsewhere is something called the USDA guidelines, US dietary guidelines. And we use those guidelines as a standard of care. So, and what standard of care means for a doctor is that it is considered almost malpractice to deviate from those guidelines. And yet my whole existence is spent in deviation from those guidelines. So I'm opening myself up to that level of prosecution all the time, but I have tons of evidence to support it. And yet none of the USDA guidelines are evidence-based. So the problem is that we've got science clashing with belief. And belief always wins at first. 
friend of mine, Tim Noakes, was prosecuted very heavily in South Africa for exactly that thing. So it is extremely challenging. And I've pretty much given up talking or trying to convince my colleagues or the naysayers that this is problematic. I say, talk my, have, say my say, I've got my YouTube channel, I've got the information out there for and this type of discussion. But ultimately, you have to be interested. There's not a single human being on the planet Earth that doesn't know that nicotine and smoking is bad. And yet people still choose nicotine and smoking, despite the evidence. You look at the, the black lungs on the box and you ignore it and open up and light up. I can't help that person. But I can help people who are seeking help. But this should not be more important for me than it is for the people I'm trying to help. So it's very difficult, it's very challenging, but that's really what we're, what we're up against, is a society that doesn't care. The people who write the USDA guidelines would say that they are evidence-based. And what I really wanna know is, do you find yourself having to convince people of your argument because society has become so familiar with these types of guidelines that you mentioned? I think that that is true, but let me just go back to the first statement you made. They believe, and that's a belief, that, the, that there is evidence to support what they say. But that in and of itself is completely wrong. I'll give you an example of, of that. One of the critical elements in 1977 when the USDA guidelines were first published was the demonization of saturated fat, that fat is bad for human beings. Now, on the 20th of May of this year, the College of Cardiology published a massive review. They went back and looked at all the literature that concerned itself with the consumption of saturated fat. And they could find zero evidence, zero evidence that the consumption of saturated fat caused harm. Okay? That's a fact. That is a scientific fact. But the USDA guidelines are primarily and dominantly based on a low-fat advisory uh, um, or advice. The, in fact, the, the limit right now is you've got to limit your caloric consumption of saturated fat to less than 10% of your overall calories. And there is zero evidence. In fact, there's the contrary evidence that that is actually a misstatement. There is zero evidence in the USDA guidelines that they've used, that they've based the argument on, to demonize carbohydrates. And we have tons of evidence that does directly correlate carbohydrates with the diseases we've been talking about all night. But they've just conveniently ignored them. Nina Teicholz is a good friend of mine. She wrote The Big Fat Surprise. And uh, Nina is tearing her hair out this week was on a call last night about, or on Monday night about this, um, try, because they won't accept the evidence. So to say that they're evidence-based is completely false. And by the way, the whole reason why the USDA guidelines demonized fat was a fallacy as well. What happened in the 1950s is more and more people were dying of heart attacks and strokes. And when they did autopsies on those people, they found this thick, fatty layer plugging their vessels. So they said, aha. They ignored the 50% of people that smoked, and they said, aha, it must be the saturated fat in our diet that's clogging our arteries and causing problems. There was no evidence to support that. That was an assumption. And you know what happens when assumptions, you know the story about assumptions, okay? Uh, about making asses out of you and me. And that's really what the USDA are. But they ignored the evidence that it was smoking that was damaging blood vessels, and that fat was trying to heal the damage that was being done, and they demonized fat. And when you remove saturated fat from your diet, food tastes like crap. So what did they conveniently add in? Sugar. That is the start of the obesity and diabetes epidemic. And it was the combination of carbs and fats. Low fat. No, low fat and high carb. And then they started adding in, they said saturated fat is bad. So then they started adding in the industrial fats. They took the, the fat, Crisco, and canola oil out of cars engines which where that oil belongs and they put it into our diet procter and gamble and those folks started using those industrial oils and it's that combination industrial oil plus sugar that caused the most damage i have a question about fat 
uh, a different kind of fat. Uh, so I was uh, keto for about four years and adored the fattiest of foods, more so than carbs. So thick dairy cream, olive oil, cheeses, the fattiest cuts of grass-fed meats. Now, can, can fat be addictive? Because I felt like I had a lot of cravings for fat. Right. Were you fat? Were you diabetic? No. Right. There's your answer. You, you ate it in abundance, but it never caused harm. And the reason for that is because fat is self-limiting. In fact, saturated fat triggers a series of at least five hormones in your intestine that send a signal back to your brain that says, boom, you're done. And even though you've eaten a lot at one time, you're not going to sit there 10 minutes later and nibble on more. You're done and you're done for a long time. That is why it is impossible to become fat from eating fat, to become fat to the point of harm from eating fat. And in fact, what you were doing was meeting your genetic and biologic needs with what you were eating. And yet you've been indoctrinated with the fact that it's bad for you. So the problem was the indoctrination. And if you look at in America, and you and I both come from other countries, when they kill an animal elsewhere, they take the skin off and they put the, the, the steak on the plate. But here they trim all the fat away. And in fact, if your cow or your pig has too much fat, they don't get the appropriate USDA stamp of approval, which is bizarre. They have to be lean. And that's why, for example, when the, when the meatpacking plants all closed down, these farmers were sitting with hogs that were getting too fat and they were not able to be introduced into the meat, into the, into the meat market because they were too fat. How ludicrous is that? Here the ketogenic people are trying to add fat back to their food. But can I circle back to something that you asked me a little bit ago? Because I didn't answer this. You asked me when you come across people that um, stop demonizing, that, that tell me to stop demonizing carbohydrates. There's no such thing. Um, let me give you an analogy of that. Let's say uh, you go out to a party, you go out to a dinner, and you meet this wonderful couple. And the guy is just good looking. He's very wealthy. He's just an amazing guy. And everybody loves the guy, he's gift to the gab, everybody's attracted to him like um, moth to a lamp, and you just have a wonderful time chatting with this guy. And you look at the wife, and she's kind of back over there in the shade, and she's got a little bit too much makeup on, and you go to the bathroom, and the wife's there, and you start chatting with her, and she's crying. And you look at her a little closer, and she's got a black eye. And her arm's actually in a sling because her arm's broken. And you chatting about how wonderful her husband is and how gregarious it is, and, what, and you're kind of imagining what he would be like as a partner, and you've kind of half fallen in love with him already. And she tells you, well, actually, he gave me the black eye and he broke my arm. And he's a wife beater. That's the problem with carbohydrates. Now, how do you reconcile that? That's difficult because how can this wonderful person that is the picture of perfection be that guy? And, and that is how serious carbohydrates are. At the same time, if you are that spouse and you fall in love with this guy who's just Mr. Wonderful, and provides everything good for you. So he's so wealthy, you don't need to work anymore. He's so uh, entertaining that you don't need your friends or your family anymore. He is great in bed. You don't need anything anymore. And you move into this house and he becomes your exclusive life's experience because he's so darn wonderful. And then on a given day, he gives you the black eye. And you know what? It's my fault. I said something I shouldn't have said. I deserved it. A couple of days later, you got the broken arm. Well, you know what? The dinner was cold. He didn't mean to do that. And eventually, after a series of beatings, now you're sitting in the emergency room. You love this person. Your whole life is dedicated to him. You have no other life, but he beat you to within an inch of your life. Now you're sitting there and you have to ask yourself, the next time he beats me, I may die. But I love him so much. And without him, I have nothing. 
Do you get the restraining order and move out of the house where you have absolutely nothing for a while and then recreate your life after that over time with incredible hard work and toughness? Or do you say, I don't care if he kills me, I'm going back home. But you cannot expect to live in that guy's house and not get beaten. That is the relationship that my patients have with carbohydrates. They love them. And the fatter we get, the more imprisoned we become by those carbohydrates. Because at 300 pounds, I couldn't exercise. I couldn't move. I couldn't do so many things. My self-esteem and my self-confidence was in the toilet. I couldn't do anything. I was exclusively dependent on sugar and starch as my entire support system. And then you get diabetes and you get so fat you can't move and you get metabolic syndrome and your blood pressure goes up and you need a sleep apnea mask and the women can't get pregnant because they've got PCOS. But they love their carbohydrates and it's all they've got. Do you care if the next heart attack kills you? Or do you say, I don't want another heart attack. I'm going to go through the misery of removing carbohydrates from my life so that I can get better. And that is the choice that every fat person, every type two diabetic has to make. And they don't make it on one day, they have to make it every day. It is that serious. It's very evident to me that you really care passionately about your patients. And I wonder, is part of that because you have been through this? I haven't been through it, I am in it. There's no, you know, I'm chasing every day two things. I'm chasing health and happiness. But there is no outcome. There's no measurable endpoint for either of those two things. So I know every day if I challenge myself to do the best I can and I move myself forward, that's the best I can do. But I will never, ever beat myself as having a vulnerability to addictive behavior. I've got to be aware of it. I've got to be cautious of it. But you don't beat this. You learn to live with it and you learn to be arrogant about it. I live because I love myself more now and I have arrogant integrity that carbohydrates are okay being demonized in my life. And I've had to create that positivity toward myself and the negativity toward the drug that tried to destroy me if I'm going to continue on this pathway. Dr. Cyrus, this has been fascinating. I've kept you way over time. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I appreciate it. I'm sorry about all the, the uh, um, anecdotes, but it's the best I can explain it. Thank you so much for having me on. This is, this is why we're listening and watching. We wanted to hear from you. Um, Health Hackers listeners and viewers, if you look at the summary text that goes with this video or audio podcast, you will see a list of ways to contact or learn more about Dr. Cyrus and his work. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe for regular Health Hackers videos. And if you're watching or listening to this through Facebook, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, then you can opt to follow the show there too. Thank you very much and see you again next time. Bye-bye.